Hi everyone, I'm Krika and this is Art Rendezvous. Welcome to episode 14. Art Rendezvous is a show where we invite incredibly talented artists and talk all about art. So if you're an art lover, please like and subscribe our channel. Our guest tonight is artist Jay Muzak. Jay Muzak is a teacher and public artist who has painted all around the world. So let's invite him on the show and learn about his art and his journey to become an artist. Hi, Jay. Welcome to Art Rendezvous. Hi, Krika. Thank you for having me. Jay, how do you style, uh, how do you describe your art style? Um, I think I've come into something um, sort of a stained glass or mosaic style. Um, it actually first started as painting. And then recently over the last three or four years, I've actually transitioned to making actual mosaic. So I really have only been doing mosaic over the last three or four years, but my painting style kind of segued me into that uh, very naturally. Did you start with the stained glass painting or, or how did you start? Oh yeah, no, I've, it's been a, it's been a long journey to get to that point. Um, I guess, um, you know, I started as a teenager doing graffiti and aerosol painting. And uh, from there, um, I got into street art in Austin when I was 19 and I was doing uh, space, outer space spray paintings down on 6th Street. Um, and then sort of evolved out of that and got into more bigger walls and mural, commercial murals in the community. Um, kind of found, found a love for teaching, doing after school program with the city of Austin. And so all that, that you know, we're talking 16, 17 years ago now, and all that was just kind of a lot of um, experimentation, really. You know, I think um, like a lot of artists, I'm, uh, you know, I get bored with the same style. So I have to kind of keep changing it up. And that's, I think, kind of the, the only constant has been change in my career. <laughs> that every few years I, you know, try something different or completely change the style or aesthetic. Um, it's obviously still, still kind of an evolution, you know, it's growing. But um, yeah, I would say, you know, the, the, I guess more what I've known for recently is um, really started in New Zealand in probably 2015. Mm -hmm. I think that was the uh, that was the first time I did a stained glass style painting, and um, the the reason being, I guess, uh, was for a specific a specific commission. It was for a South African couple in New Zealand, and um, I had visited their house and I saw their Catholic imagery along with like Buddhist statues in the in the garden, and I tried to mix those two ideas together like you know the saints with the halo and a lot of gold leaf and then the buddha being more um you know colorful and so i depicted a buddha in a stained glass style kind of trying to speak to the you know what you might see in a catholic church um you see a stained glass window but then doing it with buddhist imagery mm -hmm. and i don't know i might have been the first person to do that you know i couldn't find anything on the internet like that so i was like i'm gonna do this thing you know for the first time and try it out um, and they loved it. It was an eight by eight uh, painting. You know, it's, you could call it a small mural. It's at their house um, on two panels. But uh, it was such a hit that I was then like commissioned to do another stained glass style piece um, in another city in New Zealand for an artist um, studio. And I kind of realized that I was hitting on something that maybe hadn't really been done before or done very much anyway. You know, um, I've since seen a couple stained glass style paintings, kind of more classical. Um, yeah but coming out of graffiti and like street art and always trying to innovate a style that, you know, that is unique. Uh, it's, it's really hard. As you can imagine these days, everybody has, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Flickr, all these social medias. And so you're seeing what people are making. Whereas in the old days, you know, you could, you could create in a bubble and if nobody in your town was doing the same thing, then you're good. But now we can see, you know, our eyes are open and we can see the whole world. So it's a little bit harder to stand out and be unique. And so, when I started hitting on that and, you know, people were vibing with the style, they were liking it. And I thought, well, I haven't seen anybody doing this. And I'm an avid student of street art as well and contemporary muralists and, and graffiti writers and, and graffiti artists. So, you know, I was like, well, maybe let me just kind of cruise with this for a while. And that painting style eventually 
and we can, I guess we can get to it a little bit later, but that's what eventually, you know, led me into creating with glass and tile and ceramic that I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. And so how long have you been a full-time artist now? Um, full-time off and on. I mean, I, I do art seven days a week and I've been doing art seven days a week for most of my adult life. However, like most artists, it took some time to get to a point where art is paying the bills, you know, paying the rent, putting food in your mouth. Um, so I would say like the last four years or so I've been full-time artist. Now I still teach art two days a week. And some people say, Oh, well, you're a teacher then you're not an artist, but in actuality, right? Like I'm teaching art those days. So that's still creative. I'm just kind of sharing my passion and teachers have to be quite creative anyway. So like, I think teachers are artists themselves in the way they, you know, share information and inspire students. So those days are not days off by any means, you know, <laughs> and the other five days a week and even sometimes those nights and pulling double shifts, I'm doing my own art, you know, doing applications and design and painting and mosaic and studio work, um, painting murals on site. So, you know, you could go all the way back to when I was 19. And I think when we you know when in my head is like when I first became a quote unquote artist was when I sold a piece of art. Right. Because a lot of people make art for fun. They make art as a hobby. They don't take it seriously. They don't treat it like a profession. They don't treat it like work. Um, And that's totally fine. And, you know, there's a lot of amazing artists that do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, But I think in our society, you know, our capitalist society, if you sell something, you're a professional, right? If you sell something in that field, you're a professional. So when I was 19, um, I was doing the space painting down on 6th Street. And some of you guys might have seen that if you've gone to like Cancun or Tokyo or these various places, there's always a guy with the mask on and you know, <laughs> techno music, boom, boom, boom. And yeah. on the ground with like newspaper and Frisbees and plates and, you know, doing these really quick spray paintings. And then it's a reductive technique. And then, you know, it's like you put it all black and then you wipe it off and then pow, voila, you put the fire on. And then, and then there's like this outer space thing or like a dolphin scene or, you know, whatever. It's like, a, it's kind of a gimmick, but I actually saw the guy, Kerry Huckabee, who was doing it at the time when I was going to UT uh, down on 6th Street in Austin. And I was so taken by it when I first moved here uh, from Houston. Like, I wanted to do that, you know, because I had already been doing art in high school, just like I was in art club and I was doing, you know, graffiti tags and stuff like that. But I wanted to do that style, what he was doing. You know, he had 50 people looking around watching and it was, you know, he was selling the pieces right after he made it. I was like, that's cool. So I, I went home and actually tried it and made some, and then I, I took it down there. Um, it was, I guess, my sophomore year in uh, college at UT. I was studying sociology, and he, uh, you know, he basically said that sucks. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like go home and practice, you know. And so I took that to heart, and I actually did go home and practice more. And I, I kind of would like go on on some nights and kind of stay in the back of the crowd and watch him and try to pick up tips and you know techniques, and then I'd practice at home more and. I took a couple months, I took another one back and I was like, how about now? And he's like, man, you're pretty uh, relentless <laughs> and it's looking a little better. So why don't you come and help me next weekend? You know, so he actually invited me. He, I, I was I was an apprentice for him for, for a few months um, and I would just help him. I would just be there while he's painting and I would there help sell the paintings and help set mm-hmm. up and clean up and crowd control. If there's somebody like stupid drunk falling all over him, I just like move him out of the way. Like Sixth Street at, at two, three in the morning on a Friday night is pretty mm-hmm. well was pretty crazy. Um not not right now, but <laughs> <laughs> um, back when it was normal times and Sixth Street was was the the party street in Austin. So um this is also mind you like oh man, so 17 years ago, you know, mm-hmm. so it was a different place. There was there was actually a parking lot where we were doing it and now it's a container bar. And mm-hmm. so there's not even really a space to do it anymore. And I don't think anybody's done it in, in Austin. Yeah. Years. Um, but um, yeah, so like from that time, um, I think apprenticing with him and, and finally, you know, he let me paint one and, and, and I did it for the crowd and I painted it and then I sold it, you know, so it was over for 25 bucks or whatever. So it was the first time selling art as a 19 year old. And from there, I kind of built up where he would let me paint during the breaks or he would take off for an hour and I would, I would hold it down and do the painting and, nobody knew who was who because we were both like shaved head and had a mask on but like (laughs) um you know his were still a lot better than mine but anyway like basically uh you know there were some nights when i made a couple hundred bucks and to be to be 19 years old and selling your art like that was very exciting for me and so it kind of really 
set the tone for like how you know maybe this is legitimate maybe i can you know at least as a side job maybe i can you know do something with art um mm-hmm. i was still going to get my degree in sociology and i was still working other jobs like you know i've been a, a cook in you know mother's cafe or um cherrywood coffee house and all these random odd jobs around town um but then i finally actually found my like dream job uh for the city of austin and teaching graffiti art so mm-hmm. there's a after school program called totally cool totally art and they were looking for a painting instructor and i was like i can paint but I can also spray paint and I could do this and this. And they're like, Oh, that might actually be good for the teens because these are like, you know, at risk youth and it's, you know, inner city Austin or whatever, like this could be good. So I actually pitched the the class and it was the first time they'd ever done it. And, and they went for it. Um, Clint and Kelly, my, my uh, bosses over there at the time, uh, still director of the program, by the way, it's a great program. If anybody has teens, you should look it up. But um, started teaching art and teaching spray painting and mural painting and, you know, hip hop graffiti history and stuff like that and doing like lettering with with teenagers and getting paid to do it, you know, so and and then I could go up to walls with like my city ID and be like, hey, can we paint your wall? You know, can we paint a mural on your wall? Because, you know, I work for the city and, you know, we we use that that (laughs) trick a few times. So we got a bunch of free walls opened up and um, it was a really rewarding experience. I actually taught with them for uh, three or four years. Yeah. And um, that's also where I found my, my just general love of teaching. You know, I, I've since after that, I, I went to um, I went abroad and taught English. And so that's like that's like a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, so. uh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. Oh, no, you go. You go ahead. I'm just rambling on. I don't even remember the question. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, so what, what I was going to ask is what are the uh, major milestones that you remember from that point on when you first started painting graffiti yeah. art and then being this mature professional artist, what were the major milestones that helped you led to this point? That's a good question, yeah. Um, so I guess I was kind of starting to get into some, some what I would probably call milestones or like formative um, experiences, you know, in my life and career. Um, I think a lot of it has been just so kind of random and organic, you know, like um, that job with the city, you know, like they could have said no to my curriculum and I would have just been a normal painting instructor and we wouldn't have done any spray paint or murals and it would have been pretty lame, you know, but they went for it. And so the fact that they believed in the vision, right, they supported it. They knew that the students would love it. They're like, yes. So I think you could probably say like a lot of the milestones in my life have been based on collaborations or like, relationships i think people have you know shown they've they've either opened a door or shown me a path or believed in me and supported me in a a project or an idea and that's what has helped me along and to grow you know as an artist and and to be more successful year after year um and just just having opportunities right so i think part of it comes down to having like a positive mindset really like if you had to have a moral of the story that's probably it you know um (laughs) just seeing the possibilities as opposed to like the you know the fence if there's a fence in your path you climb over the fence you know (laughs) and (laughs) see what's over there so but anyway like um you know coming to austin that was like you know i grew up in houston and that's where i spent first 18 years of my life and i'm still connected with a lot of good friends there uh, but I don't have a whole lot of family there. My aunt and uncle, that's about it left. So the rest of my family's all over the place. So like, you know, Houston was like step one. And step two was like Austin. I moved to Austin to go to UT and study sociology. So that was like a milestone. Um, and then all the things that happened in those four years, of, or actually three years of um, school in Austin, I graduated a year early. Um, you know, finding Carrie Huckabee on 6th Street and space uh, spray painting and then like finding some uh, walls in the community to paint murals and get paid to do that and then de- uh, developing this curriculum and teaching for a t- um, totally cool totally art tcta um, and then actually so i graduated a year early because i was like so over college at that point you know and couldn't sit in the classroom anymore and i took my leftover student loans and i went to europe and i backpacked around europe for six months and i'd never been abroad aside from like the border town in mexico and it was a very eye-opening experience Um, part of the reason I went was because I had learned about couch surfing from another traveler and couch surfing is if you don't if you're not familiar is uh, basically a website where you can go on there and make a profile kind of like you would on Facebook and then 
basically like put in a destination in Italy, right? I'm going to fly into Rome, Italy. So you can see all these people who are kind of travelers and a lot of, you know, at the time it was like a lot of younger folks, you know, traveling on a budget. You can see all these people who are willing to put you up, willing to give you a couch or a floor space or an extra room um, for free, right? So you don't have to pay $100 for a hotel anymore. And you also have like a tour guide because they're going to show you around all the local spots. So because of couch surfing, I was able to kind of like craft this little tour around Europe, you know, and like in six months, I only spent $3,000. I yeah. mean, like you'd pay, I'd pay that in rent and, you know, two months in Austin now. So like <laughs> just rent, you know, that was like food and everything. The plane ticket, I think it was separate, but you know, getting over there and just being on a backpack around and hang out with people. I went like to 12 or 13 countries, made it actually down to uh, Egypt and backpacked around Egypt. And at the time, you know, I was just, I was just drawing in a sketchbook, a journal, you know, I wasn't doing a whole lot of painting. Um, I did do some help exchange stuff, kind of like um, if, if people are familiar with Woofing, it's like the worldwide organization of organic farms. And you just say, Hey, I'm a, I'm a traveler. I'm looking for work for three weeks. And they say, okay, come, you know, I don't know, dig in my garden or come and paint my walls or come and move some rocks or something, you know, and they put you up and they give you room and board and food. And so that's a good way to travel too, if you have the time, you know, but um, through that, I did like a small um, B and B mural in Italy. And I did like this other thing in Germany, but it wasn't like serious. I was still kind of just like figuring stuff out, like how to, you know, what am I doing? I was really there to like absorb and learn and see these different ways of life and everything. So but that was, it was a milestone because that it, I, I learned how to travel cheap and I learned that I love traveling and like, I need to get out of the States, you know, and just like see what else is out there. So came back to Austin for like a year or two, living in a co-op and, and teaching an after school program and doing a bunch of dumb stuff, uh, dumpster diving and, you know, things, things that <laughs> 20, 21, 22 year olds do. Um, but then, uh, a friend of mine from college, he went to Korea and taught English and we were emailing back and forth. And he's like, dude, it's so cool here. Like they pay you well and you get the weekends to hang out in Seoul and, you know, should come do it. And I was like, OK, so I pretty much went and did it. Like he told me the company he worked for and I was like, got any jobs? And yeah, it was a private English school. I taught elementary English. It was a super chill job, you know, so easy. But then you're living in Korea. Right. And you're yeah. making money and you're an, you're an expatriate. And I really like that lifestyle, you know, because you meet a lot of other foreigners from all over the world who are there doing similar things. And I fell in with a bunch of graffiti artists and graffiti writers. And the one guy, um, Barnes, he goes by the name Barnes uh, from um, Philly. And he was over in Korea as well. And we went out painting one night. And then he introduced me to some friends that he had met, some Korean uh, artists. And from there, it was just like, every weekend I was painting, it would, whether it be like illegal in tunnels, or I ended up meeting some guys at festivals and they were getting paid to paint and they invited me because I'm like the cool American guy, you know, <laughs> coming from America where like graffiti was born. And I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not claiming like OG status or anything, but I, but I do come from the States, you know, so it's a little more maybe authentic, authentic than um, Korean writers. But anyway, I'd like, you know, go out painting with those guys, painting on the Han River, painting for big festivals at Olympic Park and getting paid to paint, you know. Um, and I met some of like friends for life like that, you know. I met some really good bros that we, you know, still keep in touch with. If they come here, I'll show them around. Or if I want to visit there, that you know, it's just like, it's like, you know, just pick up right where we left off. Um, so Korea also had some, some ups and downs. Like I got quite sick there. I got pneumonia really bad. I don't know if it was from the cold or the smoky bars we were hanging out at every weekend or because um, they used to smoke inside believe it or not <laughs> and <laughs> I know that it's like unfathomable now like you cannot smoke inside anywhere and that's the way it should be but back then it was super bad and um, and it probably you know I probably wasn't using a respirator mask as much as I should have when I was painting and for whatever reason like it was real bad I got pneumonia real bad and like I almost died and um, some of those guys cared for me in some of my darkest days. And when I was like, like I was sleeping on their floor, like in and out of consciousness for a week, taking, you know, antibiotics and they nursed me back to, to health. And, you know, if it weren't for them, I don't know where I'd be. And so that's like the art friends. And I think kind of goes back to like the, the relationships and the collaborations, you know, are the milestones, I think more so than place even. I mean, place is important too, because 
But after Korea, I went to Japan and I kind of loved that even more. Like Japan, just I kind of vibe with the country and the people a little better. Um, I ended up staying there for three years. I met my wife there um, and I loved my English teaching job. Um, but I was also quite bored because I was living in a little village and that's where I produced my first book. So I did a, I did a drawing a day of uh, everything Japan and just ball pen sketches in my, in my sketchbook. And I turned that into a, a bilingual book, 430 pages. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I know. I need to get you one. Uh, <laughs> and that's, I don't have any on stock. I got to order some more. But um, <laughs> But that was that was another milestone because like I went from, you know, painting big walls every weekend to like back to drawing back to my roots, you know, and and um, and then creating a book and doing a publishing project. So I also learned about um, crowdfunding and that's how we produced the book was through a, a, an online crowdfunding campaign. So um, that was another big one. It kind of, you know, taught me another way to fund creative pursuits. You know, I don't need to have a big time commercial client. I can ask a lot of my friends and their network to kind of share this thing. And then everybody pays 30 bucks for a book. And then before you know it, 200 people will give you 30 bucks and you can publish, you know, books for everybody. And you have this thing, you know, you have this product. So um, yeah, Japan was definitely a formative time. I think, I think the um, work ethic of the Japanese really rubbed off on me too. Like the crafts people there, dedicate their their lives to perfection you know or the pursuit of perfection it's never absolutely never perfect but it's like the pursuit of it and you know staying late working late working overtime um and then also like the group ethos like the group think the group mind you know it's like like we're we tend to be quite individualistic and like Mm -hmm. independent in the states right in western countries in japan it's like you think about the group harmony before you think about yourself so if, if you're hungry, your stomach's growling, if, if nobody else is saying anything, you're just going to not say anything, right? Like you're going to wait till like the elder or the whoever's respected is, you know, says something and then you'll, you'll speak up and, and take part or whatever. But so I think that kind of um, the just way of like thinking about the world, you know, it, it really, it really shifted my, uh, my mindset. Um, and so, you know, spending three years in Japan, I had a, another big milestone there was painting my biggest wall to date or yeah, I think my biggest wall to date. It's like a three-story building with a big octopus. It's actually the the um, print over here. You can see on the wall kind of. <laughs> but uh, so yeah. that's like a three-story building on this this island in Okinawa. And um, that was my biggest wall to date. I did it with like eight levels of scaffold and big spray guns. And, you know, having to navigate the logistics of a project like that in a second language. You know, my Japanese is pretty good by then after three years. But um it was still a challenge, you know? So, um, but I think all these things is kind of building my confidence, you know, I'm able to like um, do a, a, like a diversity of projects, you know, I'm quite versatile in terms of like illustration or painting. Um, and, and that's also just kind of like, you know, I keep trying these things and then, and then just see, see what, what hits, you know? Mm-hmm. So after Japan, um, my wife and I just decided to take the long road home and we spent a year in Australia and a year in New Zealand. And Melbourne, Australia, I must say, is probably my, at least as far as I've visited, one of my favorite cities in the world for street art. And not just graffiti art, but like street art, murals. And the city of Melbourne, like, actually supports the artists. They they have an alley right downtown. It's like, imagine if we had on Congress, like an alley off of Congress that was dedicated to painting. And graffiti artists, graffiti writers, uh, spray painters can go out there and practice like that's how integrated it is with with melbourne you know city and so they let the tags happen and the tags get the the bubble letters over that and then the murals over that and and then you know it's like it everybody's leveling up their skills and the the artists in melbourne are also like some someone's just like the most world renowned at this point um not only melbourne but australia in general like softfuls in terms of graffiti letters roan doing these huge portraits um and a bunch of other guys Fintan McGee, he's one of my favorites doing figurative um, murals like all over the world now. Um, So like seeing those guys work and and just being really inspired. I wasn't doing a lot of painting at the time. I was actually learning to tattoo. Uh, (laughs) Shout out to uh, Troy McNeil at Rosen Anchor Tattoo. (laughs) I was working as a chef and right next door was his tat shop and we hit it off and uh, he liked my book. I gave him one of my books. the Japan 365 book. And then I just hung out at the tattoo shop every day and eventually started to like practice and 
Um, but the, yeah, I ended up not pursuing that, but <laughs> it was a fun, it was fun while it lasted. But, um, and then after that, I went to New Zealand for a year in New Zealand. I did actually do quite a lot of painting. Um, I was also doing like chef work and, but then I was living in this cool quaint little town called Nelson. Um, and basically after I did this one painting for the, um, this woman just like randomly commissioned me. I don't even know how she found out that I painted, but, um, like it made the paper it made like the front page of the little the town paper and so wow. after that i got like gig after gig after gig and and new zealanders pay quite well like they were not haggling price like a lot of people do here they were like very respectful and understood what art should be worth you know so it's like this is a very satisfying experience and to the point where i could quit my job at the cafe and just paint all the time you know and i painted mm -hmm. for like three or four months there um and I think that was also like very rewarding just because I saw that I can kind of do this in any country. You know, I've done this in a half dozen countries by now. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is the, you know, I'm not getting rich by any means, but I'm sustaining, you know, and this is like, this is a good life. So um, coming back from New Zealand, uh, that was back in 2016, I guess we got back to Austin and um, this kind of, plug back in you know uh, mm -hmm. actually taught for that uh, after school program one more year to kind of get my feet planted here and um, and yeah the um, the it's so random how I even ended up doing mosaic like that that is the I guess the probably the last milestone and what would bring us to like more present day in my practice but um, the the school where I'm teaching uh, Skybridge Academy I wanted to do a pixel art project and uh, a big I'm a big fan of Space Invader or Invader who's an anonymous mosaic street artist he's like the Banksy of of, of mosaic street art mm -hmm. uh, he's a Fr French guy and he's completely anonymous um, but I've been following his work for years I saw a lot of his stuff in Europe like you know 15 years ago and um, so anyway I want to do something like that for my students and so I contacted Heather Kruger who's a uh, uh, owner of the former Austin School of Mosaic Art and I said Heather would you mind being a guest artist at my school and do this pixel art thing and so we sure you know we met at her at her school and um, you know that was when my eyes kind of like bling you know my eyes started open and like seeing all the different things you could do with mosaic you know glass yeah. ceramic and just all the different styles and so we did that project with my students and it was just like kind of like pixel art they're doing like Pokemons and Super Mario and stuff uh, very very um, successful though like everybody completed their projects they loved it but then I started like ask Heather you know some more questions about this and that and we we ended up doing um, a street artist workshop with me and some friends so we could do a little more like free form organic pieces and cutting stained glass and I was by then I was just kind of hooked I was like I saw a lot of potential there um, there aren't a lot of people doing mosaic in town like contemporary well I was not contemporary mosaic but like street art mosaic and like you can say contemporary mosaic, but really there weren't a lot of younger artists doing it. So as a, as a 30 something year old, like, I think I was probably, I'm still probably one of the younger mosaic artists in town. You know, there are some fa fantastic mosaic artists, which uh, I think you've actually had on your show, Diane Sonnenberg, like she's another mentor of mine and she's fantastic. Um, and she's world renowned, you know, yeah. and, and kind of meeting her through Heather and, and being able to have kind of her as a, as a mentor um, as, as I'm pursuing more mosaic stuff. Um, I also took stained glass classes at Blue Moon Glassworks in Hyde Park, which is like the last stained glass studio in town. Mm -hmm. um, and Jim and Rose there are awesome and they do really good workshops. So I just kind of like tried to soak up as much information uh, as I could about this, about these media, you know, get my basic tools going. And then um, for my 2018 solo exhibition, it was my first solo show at the Doherty Arts Center. I made a huge seven foot, um, mirror mosaic and out of stained glass and mirror that was evoking of a uh, Dayton lowrider rim as the whole show was about lowriders and so that was like a feature piece and so I think kind of putting that up in that gallery space and people seeing like whoa what is that like I thought you're a painter you know and it just kind of like it stole the show am I am I like I'm not I mean I'm kind of bias but like <laughs> I like I like a lot of the pieces I made but like that was probably my favorite because of the way it like the light interacted and it sh like reflected shards of light across the gallery and people could interact with it and like check their makeup in the mirror and like take selfies and it, it was like it was one of the more interactive pieces yeah. of the show. that's certainly a showstopper piece yeah yeah and so I think that was also just like the response from that I'm like yeah, the paintings were cool. You know, you know, I sold most of those, but like, 
but this mosaic thing, like I want to do more of that, you know? And, and so from there, I just, I just kind of kept going. And um, I will say the last mi- big milestone that was what really gets us to my practice today is the, my first official public art commission. And that was for Georgetown um, arts and culture up in up North of Austin. Mm-hmm. So the, um, there was a call out for the municipal courthouse, uh, like main lobby wall. And it's a huge wall. Well, pretty big for interiors, 13 by 21 feet. And they kind of said, you know, just like pitch your art. It was really open. And so initially I thought, okay, I could paint a mural, blah, blah, blah. It's like same as always. Or I could try to do something nobody's ever done before. Nobody's ever, or that at least I've never done before and do like a pixelated glass mural. And um, like they had photography um, submissions and relief submissions, sculptural and installations and painting, but they went for mine. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Shit, now I actually have to make this thing. (laughs) And, and, And that was like three months of me um, like in prototyping, basically like figuring out this process um, using an image reference and, but then I like have to use like Photoshop and digital to kind of like Im- refer to the image and break it down. And then using tiny little three quarter inch glass squares to build this thing out. It ended up being 54,000 hand placed squares. And wow. that, that, yeah, that's why it took three months. And I was like, man, this, this artist stipend is not sufficient <laughs> because the budget was just not there for something like that. But I did it anyway, because, you know, I was like, I had this idea and I had to go for it. And I think that's another, um, that's another big, like, I think tenant of my practice is like, it's not about the money, right? It's never mm-hmm. been about the money. It's great when I do get paid well, but if that was about the money, I wouldn't have done that. Right. Because I would have been trying to maximize my profit. And that's mm-hmm. never what I got into this for. I got into this to innovate, to inspire, to challenge myself. You know, I often lose, you know, not often, but like I've lost money on projects, you know, just cause I want to see it through. And mm-hmm. you've got to be able to invest in yourself like that. If you believe in your, in your craft, just like you would any other business, you know, mm-hmm. if it means taking out a loan or floating it on a credit card, like you got to do that. So, so that project, basically it was a success there were definitely like rough spots and like really long installation days that um, my good friends carmen and mason have been there at every installation and they will tell you like 14 hours of like thin setting mortar or grouting is like really really strenuous and stressful and tiring and dirty and (laughs) you know i wouldn't wish it on anyone but it's necessary to like get that piece up you know and it's kind of cathartic actually um, Tony Moreno has been there documenting the whole time as well. He's a badass local photographer. Um, but that's that like project ever since that project, I've been dialing in that process. And now I've done almost a dozen, I would call it digital impressionist mosaic murals in this like pixelated glass style, uh, public works. And then I've done about, I don't know, 20 or so studio works, kind of like these uh, spray cans, like you see behind me, those are actually mm-hmm. made of tiny little 10 millimeter glass squares. Uh, about, I think it's like six six thousand plus squares each for one of us can that size as a two by four um, panel. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what brings us like to present day and kind of where I feel like my my practice is headed. You know. <laughs> I love that journey. That is uh, so. I think you a lot of artists go to school and learn, but you have just you know gone out there to different countries and learned with the masters and you know. <laughs> You have had such rich experiences. Yeah, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I got I got very few regrets, you know, in doing that doing that route. And um, like nothing against, you know, the traditional art school, like having studio time and practice and professors and um, peers who, who give you feedback, you know. And I, I just think I've kind of I've gotten that organically, you know. And as a as a graffiti writer and artist, like early on. When you go out spray painting with, with, you know, it's like you show up to a wall and you've got a backpack full of spray paint and then you show up, there's, you know, three, four other friends there. They pull out their paint, you pull out your paint, you figure out your palette, you, t- you know, you talk about the composition, you say one person piece here, one character here, another piece here. And you get the training of art and you get, you know, you're thinking about lighting, light source, you're thinking about the composition and, and, and uh, color contrast and color schemes. So it's a very dynamic way to work, you know, and you do that and you're doing that in a larger than life space where it's like eight by 20, you know, size paintings that you're doing in like an afternoon. Mm-hmm. So 
I mean, that that was yeah, but like that was largely my art school. <laughs> and then from there, it's just been picked up from like like Diane. She's been, like I said, she's been a, a wealth of knowledge and a great help. And like if if I have a problem or something or something I don't know how to do in mosaic because she's been doing it for. 30 years, I can say, I can call her up or text her and say, Hey, Diane, I got this thing. Like, what would you do? And yeah. in five minutes, she could teach me what it would take me like five months in a class, you know? So it's just like being open and being respectful and being, you know, res um, uh, receptive to like experts help and tutelage. And like that, that has taken me farther than anything else. I think it's just like learning from others, you know? And, and then, and hopefully I, I do the same. I, I, you know, reciprocate. And now, you know, I teach and I'm teaching junior high and high school and I'm teaching, you know, I have two interns now and people that I work with, you know, unofficial yeah. kind of apprentices helping me on murals and things. So I feel like I'm, I'm giving back in a very organic way too. Um, but it's just that, it's that journey. Like you got to learn from folks. And then once you get to a point of being a, you know, quote unquote expert in your field, then you've got to give, you know, you got to pass it on. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the school that I've had. <laughs> that's the schooling. So one of the uh, one of the big mosaic work that you have is in B caves, I think. Recent that's a, mm -hmm. one of the recent works, and mm -hmm. then uh, you have another one uh, recently done for that has eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'll say this: the kind of um, the format of those. It's been you know Georgetown was like a big learning curve. Uh, I use gray grout, you know, and it probably a bit limited palette. Then after that, I started to source glass from all over the world and like find, trying to find all the colors that I couldn't find because it's not like painting where you could blend. Like you have to have the glass piece to have the color, you know, and you can't blend glass, obviously, unless you like fuse and melt and I'm not doing that yet. So, so I was like source more colors. And then the B cave one, it's another rectangle format and it's, uh, we use seven colors of grout in that one. So the grout color actually like pulls out a lot of the tones of the glass and complements better. And then um, the most recent one, the eyes that, that you're talking about, um, that was a commission for a place called Dreamland out in Dripping Springs. And it's gonna be a super cool spot. It's actually good timing to give them a little plug because they're opening in like two weeks. Um, I think February 5th is their grand opening. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of funky little place. Like they've got uh, Texas most extreme mini golf course. They've got pickleball courts. They've got like a digital pour your own uh, brewery kind of spot. And then they've got this, um, like, they've got art all throughout the place, right? They've got sculptures in the mini golf um, um, section. And they've got these um, big water tanks because it used to be Richard's rainwater collection. And mm -hmm. so these big water tanks are like 8, 10, 15 feet tall. They, they've commissioned a bunch of artists to paint on them and uh, paint murals and some local and some traveling artists as well. And that's initially why I went out. They, I guess uh, somebody referred me and I talked to Gareth, who's the um, art curator out there. And he's also a talented artist himself. And he was like, well, you know, we got these tanks, you know, a few tanks left. You want to paint one of these? And I was like, yeah, but I'm kind of doing mosaic now. I'd rather do a mosaic. Like, can we do a mosaic? And the, the tanks would actually be a challenging format. They're, they're fiberglass and the way the temperatures change, it'd be a, you'd have to use a lot of... Um, sticky business to get uh, glass <laughs> to stick to it so I was like well you got any flat walls and they did they had a corrugated wall but corrugated also is metal it's wavy I was like can't do it on that but I mean we could do paneling and so thankfully they were so supportive they actually put the paneling up for me so that I could have a flat surface of like concrete backer board so yeah so they they put up the paneling uh, for us. And then the subject of the piece is actually quite simple. It's just eyes. And it's the eyes of Sahar Mahmoud, who is a, a second generation Kenyan and Pakistani woman. And she's a beautician here in town, and, um, student studying. Um, and kind of a, introduced by a friend of a friend, the photographer who is uh, shooting for this, for this piece. Um, we set up a photo shoot and we had um, Kendra, who's a good friend of mine, do the photography. And and um, her girlfriend, Jenny, was doing the makeup. And Sahar is a friend of theirs, so they kind of referred her in. So it was a very, like, organic connection. And we did a, a shoot here at the studio. And um, we actually had six models to choose from. So we did a big photo shoot. And I kind of mocked up a lot of the different ones and uh, submitted to the client. And they, they really liked that one as well. That was their favorite. That was my favorite. And I tweaked the colors a little bit. I actually changed her hair color. But she <laughs> liked it. So, uh, <laughs> um, But it made it just a little, a little more colorful, a little more dynamic piece. Um, and from there, um, 
proceeded to, you know, do my technique in the studio, which took about six weeks to basically set out every single glass tile uh, in place. Um, and there's a whole process. I won't tell you all my secrets, but, you know, there's a way to kind of like do a studio work and then take it out and, and install it in, in square feet, like in pieces, like in chunks. So I'm not like gluing every piece to the wall on site because then I'd be out there for six weeks and that would be a nightmare. <laughs> so there's like smart ways to do it. And there's a lot of things I've, I've picked up from, from Diane and others along the way that, uh, that really helped me to be as efficient as I can with something as detailed and technical as what we're doing. Um, and I've, you know, again, it's a team effort. I've had some folks um, helping me in the studio and then my, my core install team and a couple of new folks actually helped on this one. But there's like like eight or ten people out there on install days. You know, it's like a, I mean, it's a big, messy, hardworking party. <laughs> um, and and so to kind of get back a little bit to the to why you know we picked Sahara and what the subject of of the mural is, is actually Dreamland has a pretty cool um, mission in that they're trying to sort of promote um, progressive uh, immigration, you know, rights and just kind of reform of like the the the, the issues of immigration that are. Um, troublesome to me and probably a lot of others right now, you know, mm -hmm. separating families and turning away refugees and things like that. Like, that's not cool. And I wanted to speak up about that. And so Sahar being a, you know, basically a product of immigration, you know, um, and, and, and that's what has made modern America awesome is like people coming from abroad and you know, I'm an, I'm a second generation immigrant. My, my, all my grandparents came from Poland and Italy, you know, um, they were also fleeing famine and war and, you know, dictatorships and all these other stuff. So I think America has, has, and should always be that space, you know, um, we've mm -hmm. got a lot of land. It's not like we're hurting for, <laughs> you know, for space, especially in Texas. Mm -hmm. So I, it's kind of like the more the merrier. And, you know, if you read this book called open borders, which, the dreamland team actually gives out to all the artists um so they kind of you know start to think about these issues um you'll see that like in terms of economics in terms of uh social justice and just human rights like op and open borders a more open borders policy is actually good for for everybody in the long run so um so anyway i just kind of want to speak about that and like have the narrative of of sahara and her grandparents coming over you know her grandfather with $200 to his name and, and, and then he actually commit his life and he joined the military, you know, in the U S to, you know, to feed his family. Then he was, you know, was a hardworking mechanic cause he learned how to fix cars in the army. And so hard, you know, good hardworking people, they just want a chance to live with dignity, a chance to feed their family, a um, chance to give their kids an education and, and every generation thereafter, uh, you know, gets better and improves, you know, so they're not, a, you know, sucking the system dry or they're not like you know a, a negative aspect to our country right it's it's a positive thing yeah. um, um so anyway um having that that platform like anytime you're doing public work you have a platform right you have something you, you, you a lot of people are going to see it so what are you trying to say you know is it just a pretty picture or, or is there something more to it and that's what i'm increasingly concerned with like a lot of the murals i'm doing for schools or festivals or whatnot it's going to have some you know, educational um, or like social justice angle, whatever, whatever issues that I'm passionate about, I want to like express that in the work. Um, you can't always do that when with commercial work, because, you know, if you're painting a mural for a restaurant and it's a Mexican restaurant and they want to paint a picture of enchiladas, you got to paint enchiladas, you know, so you can't really express yourself that much usually with commercial right. work. So this being a, a a work in a commercial space yet having this freedom is, is really unique. So I'm really thankful for the, for the team out there for that, um, at dreamland. And, um, yeah, I would encourage people to check it out and that, you know, along with the, uh, uh the piece in Georgetown, hopefully you're not getting arrested in Georgetown and that's not how you see it, but you can actually walk in there with, you know, business hours and check it out as the first thing you see in the, in the lobby. And then B cave, the one, um, outside of whole foods, um, that one's, you know, open to the public and, there's a couple others I could, you know, I could share the, um, these, these doves that I did, these cutout mosaics was a fun project. Yeah. That's like actually in the Taco Deli building off of North Lamar, Taco Deli and Houndstooth Coffee over there. So you can just like walk in the back, it's random, you like going to the bathroom in the hallway and you see this big murals and <laughs> mosaic but dove. Seems like you're painting the town, you're just deploying it. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. I think the fun, like paint and mosaic mix is fun. That, that was a chance to do that over there. 
but also like mosaic you know it's probably going to last longer than paint like that's that's another thing i like about mosaic is it's, it's pretty permanent you know like it's on it's stuck on the building like it's set in stone and the glass is not going to fade it's not going to peel um like paint does so i'm trying to make this work that's really going to last you know generations um and what are you uh what are your most recent projects or upcoming projects that you have now yeah um recently did um can't really see them here there um but we did uh, I, I did a curated project that was kind of through the mosaic workshop which i don't know if i mentioned that yet but it, out of something cool studios where, where my studio is here uh, it's a collective of a few artists and this is where i host the mosaic workshops now and the mosaic workshop was started in summer 2019 with a small community initiative grant from the city so thank you city of austin um and we did a big public mural um out of stained glass and glass tile and ceramic reuse tile uh called the gray ghost um it's a portrait of roosevelt williams an old blues piano player um uh, over on 2400 East Cesar Chavez. But um, the Mosaic Workshop is hosted here and through just a really grassroots initiative uh, with Jasala Cycling and Raisin in the Sun and lots of um, talented um, female artists of color. Um, we reached out to some past Mosaic uh, Workshop participants and just some friends who, who do things like um, textiles and resin art and, and bead art and painting. And they all produced uh, portraits of black and Latina Chicana civil rights leaders from Austin and beyond. And they're just smaller pieces. They're, they're not necessarily murals like huge, but they're small mosaic portraits that we're going to put up around the east side and have like a unofficial kind of public art tour. And that's not city funded. That's just funded by fundraising from the community. So people who believed in the project donated money and were able to, you know, pay the artists for their time. Um, and to cover materials and installation and stuff like that. But so that project is actually ongoing. Like we showed it uh, during East in November, the East Austin studio tour. Um, but the goal is to have the pieces kind of put up at businesses or community centers or schools or wherever uh, permanently. And so that East show was like, we just kind of ran out of time to get them installed permanently. So we just put them all together in a park over uh, Boggy Creek park over there. Um, but, uh, in the east side but um so that like getting those pieces up and installed and kind of having like that tour start going like that's coming up soon probably next couple months um and then i've got a couple um mural gigs that i've, I've got to work on like painted murals um we're actually doing a, a pop-up show downtown on congress and like ninth street at an old Lavazza coffee shop with um, my something cool studio mates and myself and a couple of others so um, that's starting like in two weeks as well, I think. So February, March, um, look for the, the outside in pop-up downtown. That's it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, this, was, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for sharing your journey mm -hmm. with us. It was, um, it was very, very entertaining and inspiring. Um, so I appreciate you being here and talking to us. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for having me. I, you know, it's not every day you get to reflect on almost 20 years of your artistic journey in, in less than one hour. So <laughs> hopefully, I'd, hopefully I didn't feel rambling too much and it made some kind of sense, but um, definitely, definitely some, probably some gaps there, but yeah, I had, I had a lot of fun too. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so much to, uh, so much you had to share. So, and it's all, um, all related to how you are, how you got to this point. So That's, that's true, yeah. Very natural path. So, no, I really appreciate you guys. <laughs>
So that was our show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share it with your friends and family and don't forget to like and subscribe our channel. You can also connect with us on our Instagram live underscore art rendezvous. We'll be back in two weeks with more art and fun stories. Until then, stay safe. Bye. Thank you.